Welcome to the second of our Holy Week reflections on the Passion narrative from the St Matthew's Gospel. We begin with a short prayer. Lord God, as we continue with Jesus on his journey through this Holy Week, bless us with your wisdom, that we might find your truth revealed to us. May we be open to your calling, that our discipleship might be deepened through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then Jesus came with them to a plot of land called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Stay here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him, and he began to feel sadness and anguish. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Wait here and stay awake with me. And going on a little further, he fell on his face and prayed. My father, he said, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, let it be as you, not I, would have it. He came back to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So you had not the strength to stay awake with me for one hour. Stay awake and pray not to be put to the test. The spirit is willing enough, but human nature is weak. Again a second time, he went away and prayed. My father, he said, if this cup cannot pass by, but I must drink it, your will be done. And he came back again and found them sleeping. Their eyes were so heavy. Leaving them there, he went away again and prayed for the third time, repeating the same words. Then he came back to the disciples and said to them, you can sleep on now and have your rest. Look, the hour has come when the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us go. Look, my betrayer is not far away. And suddenly, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, and with him a large number of men armed with swords and clubs sent by the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the traitor had arranged a sign with them, saying, The one I kiss, he is the man. Arrest him. So he went up to Jesus at once, 
and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, My friend, do what you are here for. Then they came forward, seized Jesus and arrested him, and suddenly one of the followers of Jesus grasped his sword and drew it. He struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. Jesus then said, Put your sword back, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, who would promptly send more than twelve legions of angels to my defence? But then, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say, This is the way it must be? It was at this time that Jesus said to the crowds, Am I a bandit, that you had to set out to capture me with swords and clubs? I sat teaching in the temple day after day, and you never laid a hand on me. Now all this happened to fulfil the prophecies in Scripture. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Jesus and his disciples arrive in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now Jesus calls the three of his closest disciples to come quietly with him, leaving the others while he goes to pray. This is the only point in the whole of the Gospels where Jesus appears to doubt his commitment to do what he knows he must. Matthew tells us that Jesus feels sadness and anguish. He says to the three with him, My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Here is a moment in which Jesus craves companionship. This is not a time for him to be alone. One gets the sense that he asks for the company of Peter and James and John, because if they're not with him, he might lose the resolve to accept what must be. In this moment, he could flee and escape his fate. He asks them to watch with him as he prays. Having the three of them with him works. Even though the disciples fall asleep, just having them there allows Jesus to get through this moment of doubt. He chastises his disciples for not being able to remain awake with him, but it seems as if he's just glad that they're there. They keep him focused. He's now resolved. The decision to go through with it is finally made. You can sleep on now and have your rest, he tells the three who were with him. The time has come. Jesus hears Judas and the soldiers near. There's no question now that Jesus is ready. His disciples try to defend him. They're ready to fight, but that's not the way now. This is how things must be. Jesus will not resist. He says to Judas, My friend, do what you are here for. He rejects the resistance of his disciples. Put your sword back. He even tells those who have come to arrest him that they need not have brought their weapons. Am I a bandit that you had to set out to capture me with swords and clubs? The disciples scatter. Jesus, having needed them nearby a few minutes ago, is now able to stand alone. At this moment he has no need of them. This is not what they have been prepared for. Their moment will come later, after the resurrection. Ultimately, Jesus puts all his trust in God, but the presence of the three close friends is not insignificant. Even though they slept, they were there with him. They gave him something of normality, something that said to him that he was not alone. He would be alone later, but when the decision had to be made, his friends were with him. They were there for him. We are learning in our current situation the importance of having people that we can depend on, friends, neighbours, family. They may not be physically with us, but simply knowing that they are there is important for us. Even in our solitariness, we know we are not truly alone. And of course, Jesus is always present with us. We are reminded of our need for companionship and of the needs of others 
for our friendship. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, when you needed your friends, they were there, even if they could not help falling asleep. Make us present for those who need us, and make us sure of your presence. Amen. The men who had arrested Jesus led him off to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Peter followed him at a distance, right to the high priest's palace, and he went in and sat down with the attendants to see what the end would be. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus, however false, on which they might have him executed, but they could not find any though several lying witnesses came forward. Eventually, two came forward and made a statement. This man said, I have power to destroy the temple of God and in three days build it up. The high priest then rose and said to him, Have you no answer to that? What is this evidence these men are bringing against you? But Jesus was silent. And the high priest said to him, I put you on oath by the living God to tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus answered him, It is you who say it, but I tell you that from this time onward you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. What need of witnesses have we now? There you have just heard the blasphemy. What is your opinion? They answered, He deserves to die. 
Then they spat in his face and hit him with their fists. Others said as they struck him, "Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you then?" Meanwhile Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him, saying, "You too were with Jesus the Galilean." But he denied it in front of them all. "I do not know what you are talking about," he said. When he went out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, "This man was with Jesus the Nazarene." And again, with an oath, he denied it. "I do not know the man." A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, "You are certainly one of them too. Why, your accent gives you away." Then he started cursing and swearing, "I do not know the man." And at once the cock crowed, and Peter remembered what Jesus had said, "Before the cock crows, you will have disowned me three times." And he went outside, and wept bitterly. Following his arrest, Jesus is taken to the house of the high priest to face trial before the Sanhedrin, the religious council in Jerusalem. It is the religious leaders who are most keen to see the back of Jesus. False witnesses are sought, so that they have a reason to ask Pilate for a death sentence. But in the end, it's Jesus who gives them all the reason they need, as he claims, "I tell you, that from this time onward." You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. This is blasphemy, Jesus putting himself on a level with God. For this he must die. Jesus, though we know, is not being blasphemous; he is speaking the truth. In human terms, he now has nothing to lose. There is no way that he can avoid execution. There is nothing he can say that will save him. Tell the truth. Say it how it is. Let the leaders decide what needs to be done. He forces the authorities to decide whether he is who he says he is, or whether he is an impostor, making impossible any claims for himself. They make the wrong choice. They condemn him to death. Meanwhile, Peter is also making wrong choices. Three times, each time more vehemently than the last, he denies knowing Jesus, and being one of his disciples. He's not fooling anyone. They all know he's with Jesus. His accent gives him away. He can't help himself. He's terrified of getting dragged into it with Jesus. But penitence comes quickly for Peter. The cock crows, and Peter remembers what Jesus had said to him just a few hours earlier. Before the cock crows, you will have disowned me three times. It's like a switch is thrown in Peter's head. How could he have done that? Is he not Jesus' closest friend? Is he not the one Jesus turns to when he needs someone he knows he can rely on? And now, at the most crucial moment, this denial. Peter goes out and weeps bitterly. Jesus knew him so well. Jesus knew him better than he knew himself. The story of the Passion in the Gospels gives us a sense of Jesus not really being in control of events. But that's not really the case. Jesus is in total control. The high priest and the Sanhedrin have no choice but to send Jesus to his death. He gives them no choice. He knows perfectly how they operate, what inspires and drives them. He knows Peter perfectly too. He knows how Peter will act in this moment. And when you look at the story as a whole. Everybody acts exactly as they need to, for Jesus to fulfil his destiny. Judas, Peter, the twelve, the Sanhedrin, Herod, Pilate. They're not puppets. 
but they all act according to their character and Jesus knows it and gives them the opportunities to do that. They all have a choice. They could all act differently, but they all act in character. This part of the story reminds us that we are all the people we are. Changing is not easy, but we see in Peter especially that turning about from our mistakes, putting the past behind us, repenting, is possible. Because Jesus makes it possible. Peter is given the opportunity, because of Jesus' prediction of his denial, to repent and turn his life around to become a new person in Christ. The same would be true of the other disciples, perhaps even of Judas, maybe of other characters in the story, we are not told. And the same is true of each one of us. Jesus gives us opportunities to turn our lives around. He's ready to forgive when we repent. He knows who we are and how we will behave, but he also gives us grace to be made new. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you know us better than we know ourselves. But give us grace to be made new, and may we, like Peter, find a way before you in penitence for our sins. Amen.